السلام علیکم سنس چائلڈ ہڈ آئی بین اے ویری انکوزیٹو پرسن اے بوائے ہو وانٹیڈ ٹو نو دا ٹروتھ اے بوائے ہو وانٹیڈ ٹو نو ایوری تھنگ آئی اسٹل ریمبر دیٹ وین اے ٹوائے آف مائنڈ گاڈ بروکن اینڈ ارلیئر ان دا مارننگ آئی سو اے کورل آن دا اسٹریٹ I somehow wondered, was there a link between the breaking of the toy and that quarrel? So, I don't know, perhaps I was a born researcher, a born philosopher, a born thinker, I don't know. But, and obviously at that time I did not realize, but I, I was always trying to find, trying to go into the core of things, trying to know the why of everything. It was not very late when I discovered that this particular quest is perhaps one of the greatest quests of human history. And today science is looking for a theory of everything. A theory which tells us how everything, including the psychological concepts, the philosophical concepts, the things which we take for granted, things which are in our emotions, the things which are in our behavior, the things to which science has not yet paved its doorways to, how are they interrelated? Is there a grand cosmic theory? Is there a grand super consciousness which somehow is all pervasive, which somehow deals with everything we do, we teach, we act, we think, and do we really think? So this was the framework. Fast forward, 2005 earthquake, 7.6 magnitude tremor that shattered uh, the mo most of our areas in the north. 83, 87,000 people uh, died, uh, 3.5 million displaced. A huge rescue and rehabilitation effort obviously started immediately. The, the best part is that, yes, obviously the government, the military and all the external and inter internal agencies and the NGOs and all of the international donors, they came in and they started helping but the single most prohibitive force that acted were the common people. They were just common people and uh, we witnessed that in the, uh, especially in Karachi. I was a part of those uh, efforts which were there and it was that time that again that childhood mindset from dormancy it came uh, into action again in my mind and I started making sense of whatever I could uh, I would think naively in my uh, childhood now it, it started taking the shape of a question and the question was despite of all of our differences political, social, cultural color, caste, creed, religion why? Why? At the time of a crisis, at the time of distress, at the time of neediness, why do humans just come together from nowhere? They come out to be such a resilient force that they actually can mold and change the way and the direction of things. Well, <laughs> life moved on, the question was there, it went into dormancy again, but then after five years in 2012, with uh, Hurricane Sandy in New York City, this came up again, and the same history repeated itself. There were efforts on the government level, on every level, but again the, the vital force that acted in that scenario were again common people. 
that was the time in 2012 where I was busy in one of my shows with science and spirituality being the theme. And uh, I was into the research of concepts of amalgamate, amalgamation of religion, spirituality and science. So I, that was the best time. I started digging into things. I started digging into theories of interconnectedness and what they meant and what, were, what did modern science, psychology and philosophy said about it. It took me an year before I reached a certain mindset. I'll share with you two uh, studies which helped me move into a direction of this why. In 2013, there was a study uh, in a university in uh, Georgia, I think its name was Epore University in Georgia, Atlanta. And this study, it was a very interesting study. They had mice, chuhe, they had mice in their cages and the mice were subjected to a, a smell of a chemical called acetophenin. And that, that smell was like the smell of uh, uh, almonds and uh, cherries. So the mice were subjected to that smell and each time they were subjected to the smell, immediately after the smell, they were given a very minute scale electric shocks. This was done a number of times over a period of days. And what came out to be uh, an amazing fact is that the mice developed a psyche in which they always knew that whenever they will smell that chemical, there would be an electric shock following. Fine. The mice were given the opportunity to offspring and interestingly, the baby mice who were never subjected to that phenomena, they also inherited, rather genetically inherited the same fear. They were never given electric shock, but when they smelt acetophenin, they just started running away, fleeing away. Like they knew that after this, they will be given a shock and they were never subjected to that shock. The third generation also had the same fear. So, <laughs> interestingly, it came out to be as a, research, as, a, as a result of that study, it somehow, somehow, and this somehow is not discoverable even today, somehow that fear transmitted through genes. And when scientists researched into this phenomena and they wanted to find a clue in philosophy or psychology, they came around an astounding fact. And the fact is that this was postulated, rather theorized by Carl Gustav Jung, the two fathers of psychology and psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Jung postulated a theory uh, in the early 20th century that there exists in the deepest portions of our mind a type of consciousness which he labeled as collect the collective unconscious, not subconscious, the collective unconscious. And Gustav Jung postulated that this unconscious is genetically inherited amongst human species. This is not something which you gain by your worldly experience. A child is born, he is born with that overall ancestral repository of data and that data lies dormant inside your mind unless, and this is the interesting part which links to our topic, unless a crisis emerges. And when there is a situation, when there is a crisis, when there is some adversity, somehow your psyche taps into that repository, takes out the appropriate measures, 
positive or negative, whatever, that depends upon your person as well, your personality as well, and those measures are immediately deployed. Humans don't know this. I don't know this. I don't know in the normal circumstances that I have an access to a repository, a, rec a, a, a huge database of record that dates back to my four, 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 four fathers. The mice research just proved three generations. But we don't know. Research is going on. Active research is going on. So this was one thing. Some, some sort of interconnectedness exists between the very fabric of, between the very nature of things. The first clue which I got. The second, I always wanted that, fine, this clue is good, but this relates to psychology and psychological analysis normally uh, is, uh, is supported by evidence which takes a very long time to be uh, executed and furnished. I'm an engineer, so I wanted to know, is there any empirical mathematical evidence to this interconnectivity? And then I came across quantum physics. As you must be knowing, quantum physics is the science of the infinitesimally small subatomic particles. And these subatomic particles are the building blocks of nature. All of the matter, all of us which are around here are based upon these blocks. And I'm not talking about electrons, protons and neutrons. I'm talking about particles which form these fundamental particles to the level of quark. And if somebody is interested, he or she can go and see the standard model in physics. 17 fundamental particles and forces of nature. The last one was the Higgs boson. Now, there is a foundational level concept in, in quantum uh, physics which deals with the concept of quantum entanglement. Now, what is that entanglement? It says that there is an atom, let's assume the subatomic particle here at my palm. And there is another subatomic particle at the other end of this galaxy, maybe millions and billions of light years away. Somehow, these two particles are so intricately and closely interconnected that if I change the state of this particle, this change of state is instantaneously reflected in that particle which is billions of light years away. And this is hardcore science. Anybody can go and verify. <laughs> Quantum physics is a bizarre phenomenon. But it has been so accurately mathematically proven that all of the development of today, your mobiles, your laptops, and the upcoming quantum computers are due to exploration and manifestation, technological manifestation of this phenomena. So nobody doubts its, doubts its efficacy. Nobody. This was the second clue of interconnectedness, of a tight woven fabric in which everything somehow is linked and interconnected. I think this collective resilience is one instance of this overall interconnectivity. We are connected. We have our ancestral memories. We are connected in our materials through some sort of cosmic link, which quantum tells us. At the very time of a crisis, somehow, this spawns into action, and that is what we call collective resilience. So it's a small piece in the big puzzle. And the big puzzle, all of the science is up to, the theory of everything as postulated by Stephen Hawking's late. This, this is the core, this is the essence. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway for me, and I'll tell you, there is a song on YouTube, song. Uh, we are all connected. 
you can go to the YouTube and listen to that song. It's a four-minute song. Top scientists of today, Carl Sagan, uh, Richard Feynman, Tyson, Carl uh, DeGrace Tyson, and uh, Bill Nye, all of these four scientists who do a lot of TV shows as well, their, their concepts about the biological, the chemical, the intergalactic interconsciousness connectivity is uh, in that song. Their quotes are there in that song. So what's the takeaway? We are all connected. After, after all of the research, I, I developed a new mindset. I developed a new approach towards life. And that approach is that whatever is said into religions, don't harm anybody, be good to everybody. The, the difference between good and evil. I do something good. Today's mindset has become that if I do something good, it has to be good for me. It has to be profitable for me. I'll be building a, a, a social media persona in which I will be liked, I'll be followed. I, I. It's, it's all about me. The system is not designed for me. It is designed for us. What does all of this interconnectivity show? How does this collective resilience and all of the other stuff pop in? This shows that it is beyond oneself. It is the self. The self, I am a small part of that self. We all are the small part of that self, but together we make that self. Rather, we, we mirror that self. So, <laughs> the boundaries of religion, science, spirituality are now being crossed by latest scientific research. And this is the kind of intellectual capacity which we need to develop. Not only in this country, but globally. Very few people globally even globally, not in Pakistan, even globally, very few scholars see the world in this way, but the number is increasing. The number is increasing. The boundaries of caste, color and creed, the boundaries of religion, the boundaries of uh, third, second and first world, they are disseminating. They are, they are being abolished. Why? Because science tells us that our thinking is not confined to mere individualistic approaches and benefits. It is rather a universal phenomena and I am hopeful that this path will lead us, humanity, into something which we have been calling omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, omni benevolence, which some prefer to call cosmic consciousness and others prefer to call God. Thank you.